Okay, now we're back and uh, we've got uh, a lot of space to work with and we're going to start now on effectively the general case of the implicit function theorem, in particular the nonlinear case, more general case. We are going to start with just uh, the two variables x and y again and then we'll go to the multivariate case. So let's start with a diagram over here of our uh, level curve uh, for the function capital F, the level curve at, say, uh, level C. So let's uh, so say that our level curve looks like this. Uh, it could go on here, it could go on here, or it could connect, it doesn't really matter. Uh, let's just say this is, uh, this is now going to be uh, the level curve, uh, x, f of x, y equals C. And let's put some axes in here. So uh, maybe I'll use a different color for the axes. I've mostly been using blue, so let's just try doing that. Let's put a y-axis here. Let's put an x-axis here. X, y. And uh, now, notice that things are already going to be a little bit different than they were in the linear case. Let's uh, suppose, for example, that uh, and let me use a blue to start with over here. Let's suppose that uh, this is x. Well, uh, in the linear case, it turned out that if we could generate a function little f, if y would be a function of x, uh, that was true everywhere in the, in the space. If this, however, is an x, then any function that we can generate isn't really going to work for this x because there isn't any y for which f of x, y equals c. So things already don't look quite the same. Uh, secondly, let's, and now here I'll use uh, a different color here. Let's suppose that uh, this is x here. Now, um, we may be able to define a function little f, y equals little f of x, but notice that that's not going to be unique because here's a y that where x and y, where f of x, y equals c, and up here is another y where capital F of x, y equals c. There are two different points on our level curve here, uh, where f of x, y equals c, so we might generate our function little f, but it's not going to be single-valued. And of course, I could have it multi-valued by having a level curve that kind of wiggles around some here. So things are kind of working uh, quite a bit differently. So what we're going to do here is we're going to say that things might work if we say this is x bar, so we have a particular x and a particular y, let's say that's here, okay, and so this point here now, let's write that uh, here, is x bar y bar, and at x bar y bar we do have capital F of x bar y bar is equal to c. I've chosen a point on the level curve. I've chosen a point that does satisfy. In fact, remember, this was our equation that we referred to as star, so let's continue to do that. So x bar y bar does satisfy our equation star here. And moreover, if we restrict ourselves to a neighborhood, an open set around x bar, y bar, then these two problems that we just noted a moment ago don't show up. Here, if I chose, choose a, a neighborhood of x bar, y bar, then it is the case that for x's close enough to x bar, let's say in this little neighborhood here, this little open interval, uh, it is the case that we can find a y such that x, y, satisfies the equation star. Moreover, that y is going to be unique. I don't have to worry about the y down here. 
So the two issues that showed up here don't show up if we restrict ourselves to a neighborhood here. And in fact, then let's just see what happens. We have uh, a tangent line. This is supposed to be a straight line here. A tangent line. <laughs> That's not supposed to curve up like that. So we have a tangent line here. And that tangent line is f sub x, the partial derivative of f with respect to x, delta x plus f sub x, that should be f sub y, delta y equals 0. And that's where f sub x is the partial of f with respect to x f sub y is the partial of f with respect to y, but evaluated at x bar, y bar. So this is f sub x at x bar, y bar. This is f sub y at x bar, y bar at this point here. And the pink line here is tangent, uh, which gets expressed in, in this uh, equation here. And uh, let's note, in fact, I'll write that down here. Note that I can take this equation and I can rewrite it as delta y over delta x is minus f sub x over f sub y, just like we had in the linear case, because of course I've transform the problem, in effect, into a linear case problem, the, the pink tangent line to our actual function, capital F, down here. And so it appears that what we did in the linear case is going to work for the nonlinear case so long as we are careful to say that it, we can only say it's working in a neighborhood here of some point that satisfies our equation. That's the first thing. And the second thing is we can't say that things work globally. We can't say that this is, is this derivative everywhere. We can only say that the derivative of the function, and in fact, of course, we're going to end up with a function y equals f of x and f prime of x will be delta y over delta x in the limit. And so that is, again, going to be fx divided by fy. So as long as we're careful uh, to say this is only going to work in a neighborhood of some point that satisfies star and that it does not work globally, then everything is going to go through. One more point. Remember that things didn't go through in the linear case when f sub y was 0, when b was 0 over there, uh, where we uh, were working in the linear case before. And of course, the same thing happens here. So if we look at this point here, and this is now, I'll still use x bar, y bar. So this is a different x bar, y bar. Now, the tangent line, of course, looks like this. Again, it's supposed to be a straight line. It's tangent. This is still the tangent line, but now the tangent line where the two partial derivatives are evaluated at this x bar and y bar. But of course, it's no longer the case that I can say this and this. And in fact, I can no longer say that there's even a function lowercase f, that gives me y because just like in the linear case, if I move in this direction, there's no y that satisfies star, just like over here. And if I move in this direction, I have multiple y values that will satisfy star, not unique, so I don't have a function. So none of this goes through when f of y is equal to zero, just like in the linear case. And so this is really a picture of the general implicit function theorem when there's only 
two variables, x and y, but it really tells us pretty much what happens, even if there, the x variable is multivariate, if, there's, if x is a vector, and if y is a vector, and things work really just the same as they're working in this two-dimensional picture here. So uh, at this point, I think what we will do is now we will actually uh, state <laughs> formally and explicitly, explicitly the implicit function theorem. And we're going to state it for general vectors x and general vectors y, not just the two-dimensional case where we have a single x and a single y. And so uh, we'll do that over here. And we're going to start by laying out the assumptions of the theorem. And so let's uh, put those here. We have uh, first, uh, let's say, let x be a subset of R M, and let's let y be a subset of R N. And let's let these be both open sets. Let's let uh, capital F be a function from x cross y into Rn. So unlike the situation we had before, uh, where our capital F was a real valued function. Here it's a vector valued function. And in fact, notice in the same dimensional space as the, what I'll call the target variables here, the y variables, both Rn, this is Rm, m could be equal to n, but in general it would be typically different. Uh, we want this to be uh, a continuously differentiable C1 function. We want to have uh, a particular point, x bar, y bar, in x cross y. And so here we're doing what we did over here in this special case, in this little example. We're going to be saying, here's what happens near a point in the domain of capital F. And of course, you'll notice that since X and Y are both open sets, we've got a point that's in an open set. So in fact, I can find the neighborhood around that point. That's completely in X cross Y. So that F is defined there and is continuously differentiable there. And let's uh, designate capital F of X bar, Y bar, to be C, as we did before. But of course now, this C is not a number, but a vector, uh, because F maps into Rn. And so I'm going to draw a line under here, just to separate out these assumptions of the theorem from the rest of the theorem. I could say from the conclusion, but its conclusion is itself going to be an implication. So let's say here we have, if F sub y, this is the derivative of capital F with respect to the y variable, but here that's the y variables, and capital F itself uh, takes on n values, so this is going to be a matrix. I'll come back and write that down in just a moment. If F y, F sub y, is a non-singular matrix at x bar, y bar, and now let me write that down here. Let's say that f sub y here is the matrix of partial derivatives of f, and here we'll say f, let's say, k with respect to uh, y sub i, let's say. And this is, of course, going to be n by n because the f function takes on n, n vectors as the 
as the targets, as the uh, the uh, the target variables, and uh, the the y's, the variables, they're also in n space. So this is going to be an n by n matrix of first partial derivatives of the f function with respect to the y variables, and this says. If that's non-singular at x bar, y bar, maybe it's worthwhile to just pause for a second here and say, what would this be in the m equals 1, n equals 1 case? That would be the case we started with. That would be the case over here, 1x variable, 1y variable. And so then this n by n matrix would just be a number, 1 by 1. And we'd be saying the derivative of capital F with respect to y is non-zero. And that's exactly what we had over here in the 1 by 1 case. Okay, so if f sub y is non-singular uh, at x bar, y bar, then there is a C1 function f, lowercase f, that goes from the uh, x variables to the y variables. And in fact, uh, let me change that uh, because this isn't necessarily going to be defined on all of x. And the reason for that is something we have already seen. In fact, let's just take this whole thing off of here. The reason for that is what we saw over here. We can't say that this is going to be defined on all of x. For example, it couldn't be defined on all of this x interval here because we have this problem that showed up here of multiple values of y. So there's a C1 function, f, on a neighborhood in the x space into the y space uh, that satisfies the conditions that we already identified in the, in the simple linear case. And so let's say the first condition is going to be simply that indeed f of x bar is y bar, so that in the one by one case here, x, if we start out here at this point, we don't end up with this point as the, as the y that comes from x bar. We end up with the right one up here. Okay, and second, for every x in our neighborhood in the x space, and of course that neighborhood in the x space in this picture here would be this open interval. I didn't give it a name over here. Um, and that uh, here, for this conclusion, this condition, we have that for every x in the neighborhood, of course, capital F of X and F of X equals C, meaning that, in fact, as we move through the X values in this neighborhood, we pick up the values F of X, the Y's, then we pick up just the Y's such that F of X and Y, and so let me maybe point out that these are the y's that go along with the x's, f of x and y is equal to c. And of course, lastly, the derivative of the f function, the derivatives of the f function, and that is that f sub x is equal to minus f capital F sub y inverse times capital X. Um, uh, let's uh, say, and I guess I should put that in here, um, where everything is evaluated, of course, at x bar, y bar. So uh, we've already said what F, capital F sub y is. It's this matrix of first partials of capital F with respect to the y variables. And so here I've got the inverse of this n by n matrix. Capital F sub x is the analog for the x variables, partial of xk, let's say, partial of fk with respect to, let's say, 
xj, that of course would be m. Um, that would be, uh, let's, uh, let's check, I think that's going to be, uh, uh, we're going to end up with that n by m, but let's just check and see. And f sub x here is going to be the partial of f sub, uh, let's say, i with respect to x sub j. And that is going to be, that's going to be, um, that's going to be n by uh, m. This is going to be n by m. And so that should have been obvious to me. This was a, this was a mistake down here. Uh, that can't be right because, of course, here I've got f inverse, which is n by n. And so this is going to have to be n by something. So this should be n by m. And so then what we get is n by n matrix times an n by m matrix. This is going to be n by m as well. And that's actually right because we have n rows corresponding to the values of the f function. And we have m columns corresponding to the x variables. And there are m of the x variables. So this is it. This is the implicit function theorem. This is the implicit function theorem applied to this particular capital F in the case where we have m equals 1 and n equals 1. And everything in the, uh, both the assumptions, we described those over here, and the conclusions are exactly what we figured out over here. And then notice that what C does C enables us to do everything in terms of analyzing the derivatives, in terms of analyzing uh, the function, lowercase f, and its derivatives, to do everything linearly, everything in terms of matrix algebra. We're going to come back a little later, and maybe I'll do that as a separate uh, lecture or a separate example lecture, uh, where we actually apply this. Uh, and use matrix algebra in demand theory, for example. So that's it. This is the implicit function theorem. We're not going to give a proof of the implicit function theorem. It's not terribly difficult, but it would involve a fair amount of time, and I don't think uh, the, the cost-benefit analysis in terms of the cost of the time it would take us to do this and the benefit in terms of how insightful doing the proof would be, not really worth our, our time, I think. And of course, the proof is available all over the place. In many mathematics for, for economists uh, textbooks, uh, in Simon and Bloom, for example, uh, De La Fuente's book, for example. Uh, I don't believe it's in Sundaram's book. Uh, and of course, it's available online, and it's available in lots of uh, um, uh, advanced calculus books in, uh, in mathematics.